Hello, good evening, everyone. Hi there. I'm uh, Marsha Henry, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Gender Studies here at the LSE. And I want to start this evening by saying something about um, world events and to say that this really is a period of mourning and grief. And I want to recognize that. Um, and um, I can think of no better way for us to start processing some of that um, tonight um, with the presence of Cynthia Enloe and talking about her book, 12 Feminist Lessons of War. Um, we didn't think it would be um, that relevant. <laughs> it's always relevant, but we didn't think it would be so meaningful on, on, uh, on today. But um, I did want to just just pause and just to recognize that. And I know that um, some of the examples and some of the issues that are going to come up today in the talk will affect people in different ways. So please um, do what you can to take care of one another in the audience and to take a break if you need to, um, or just let anybody else know. There'll be people wandering around with, with mics and other people around. So do do just, you know, flag up if you if you need any help or anything like that. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, on this very practical note to follow that, um, I need to tell you about uh, what happens if there's a fire alarm. Um, and if there's any emergency procedures, uh, you'll have to evacuate, you'll know and um, uh, the place to congregate is uh, in Lincoln's and Fields, which is across. I'm pointing this way, but I don't know that that's actually <laughs> this way. Um, uh, so just letting you all know, we're not expecting a fire alarm or anything else. Um, I wanted to also tell you that the event is being recorded, but the question and answer period, which will follow, will not. Um, so that's to, to um, hopefully um, make people feel comfortable in expressing themselves in the question and answer period. Um, unfortunately, just due to the logistics of things, we won't be able to take questions from the Zoom meeting. Don't panic, everyone in the audience. I'm sorry to those who are on Zoom, but it's just uh, a little bit difficult for us to uh, manage the questions coming in, but I hope that you'll have another opportunity. Um, maybe Cynthia can tell you about the next place that she's giving her talk, um, if you happen to be there. And I want to, of course, acknowledge all of the hard work, um, none of which was down to me in organizing this event. Um, Violet Fox, who's right there, has been instrumental in it. Violet. <laughs> want to say something Violet about oh, uh yes <laughs> yes I do um this is a wonderful event I'm so glad you can all be here tonight and also thank you to the publisher of Footnote Press we have Grace here which is wonderful and wanted to express that there will be book sales and signing happening after the discussion so if you're interested in taking home a signed book that will be outside there's a red table you will not miss it so that will be available as well Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, just to let you know uh, the sort of format of the evening, we're going to have, um, uh, I'm going to say a little bit about um, Cynthia and Amanda, who are here um, today. And um, then um, Cynthia is going to answer the two questions that we prearranged. <laughs> They're pretty big questions. Uh, and then Amanda is going to respond to um, uh, Cynthia's new book and some of the ideas in it, and then we'll um, we'll open up for questions after that. And when we do have the question and answer period, it's uh, it would be really helpful if you could just say your name and um, yeah, anything else about you that you would like to share with the group. Okay, what do you think? <laughs> okay, well. Uh, you know, Cynthia always sends a bio that's extremely short, which just, I mean, it, it's really not fair to just capture just a few, few of uh, Cynthia's accomplishments and contributions. 
to feminist um, peace and um, militarism thinking. So Cynthia is, um, again, many of you know this, Cynthia is a feminist activist, researcher, and teacher. And she is research professor at Clark University in Massachusetts and internationally known for her work on women in the military, women in the global garment, banana, diplomatic, and banking industries, and in domestic service. Her 15 books, including Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, Making Feminist Sense of International Politics, have been translated into Chinese, French, Icelandic, Japanese, Spanish, Swedish, Turkish, and Ukrainian. She has been awarded honorary doctorates from universities around the world and regularly appears on international news channels. In 2018, Cynthia Enlow was chosen as one of the 100 names written on the gender justice wall at the International Crimes Court in The Hague. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, Dr. Amanda Chisel is a reader in gender and security at King's College London in the Department of War Studies. Amanda's research focuses on the privatization and decentering of global war making. Her work is located at the nexus of feminist international relations, global political economy, and security studies. And she employs ethnographic methodologies to examine the racial and gendered aspects of private military and security companies, PMSCs, global operations. Her work is concerned with how gendered and racial logics sustain difference, assign value, and reproduce hierarchies amongst these workforces and the ways in which these security market relations involve household labor. Amanda's most recent book, I would definitely recommend getting a copy of this. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Recent book is a distillation of the past 14 years of ethnographic research with Gurkhas and other private security actors in Afghanistan, the UK and Nepal, entitled The Gendered and Colonial Lives of Gurkhas in private security from military to market. So I'm so pleased to have uh, Amanda speaking to Cynthia's book and to have Cynthia here on this occasion. Okay, so 12 feminist lessons of war. Look at that. <laughs> I need bigger post-it notes. <laughs> um, I really like this book because Cynthia um, continues so much of what she has done in, in other works uh, around themes like uh, feminist curiosity, around um, the persistence of patriarchy, around uh, centering analyses from women's lives, um, the famous question that Cynthia asks, where are the women? But of course, so many scholars have now taken that question, where are the women, and asked it in so many different ways. Which women, uh, where are they located? Um, you know, all of the ways in which we've been influenced to think, I think, uh, in a multitude of ways about these important questions. So I guess my first question to Cynthia is really, I'm gonna ask these, the, uh, these two larger questions um, together, and then hopefully Cynthia can, can spend the rest of the time uh, addressing those. But I wanted to know what was the catalyst for this book um, and how did you arrive at these 12 lessons? So how did you, you know, distill all that? There must've been many more lessons that you wanted to include in these, in this, in these pages. And yeah, how did you decide, okay, these are the 12 lessons that I want to, to hold on to and that I wanna share? Um, with the world. And I guess I, I'd like to ask you if you could um, share three parts or three sections of the book that you feel give the audience a sense of the book's feminist commitments. Like what are the, the commitments that you want us to take from these 12 feminist lessons? Yeah. Thank you. Isn't Marsha wonderful? She just asked the most simple, <laughs> direct <laughs> questions. I mean, really, you are a friend. I mean, you're brilliant. <laughs> okay, but you're not going to let you're marching away. The title of your new book that comes out in April, please. The End of Peacekeeping. The End of Peacekeeping. So if you want to see what does it mean to do a feminist analysis, international peacekeeping, read Marsha Henry. 
the end of peacekeeping, right? An upbeat title, but you know, <laughs> right. Well, I'm, I'm so pleased to be here. I'm so pleased to be with all of you on this rainy night. I mean, it's just a beautiful London night, isn't it? <laughs> right. But it, I mean, I think it shows feminist stamina. I think in this room, we just have a lot of commitment, right? No puddles and, you know, frames canceled and so on would keep you away. So I'm, I'm really, I'm delighted. And I'm delighted that Amanda and Marsha and I get, to, is this our third? We could go on the road. I think we've done, we've done three very different events together. The dynamics is always friendly, but different, right? So this is so... You know, this is this is the team, and this is the King's LSE team, please. Right? We like a little, you know, mixture across. You know, people actually you can walk across the street to another <laughs> university. It's just amazing. I mean, you could even go as far away as SOAX or to Westminster. I mean, it's just no telling what you might find. So, so I'd also like to celebrate their networking that really allows us to really understand um, each other's uh, research, our puzzles, our explorations. Um, it really means a lot. I think one of the things that um, Marsha really hit on here, which I think is really important, is that the title that I gave the book, meaning my thought was 12 Lessons of War, not these 12 lessons, right? Not like these are the 12, you're stuck with them. There are no more lessons. It's simply, there is, whoops, there's no need, right? They are just, um, to prove I can go down and back up again, uh, 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 they are just 12 and counting, which means for all of us, I mean, this is why it's so great to all be together in real place in real time, as well as Zoom, um, which is Zoom is kind of real, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of real. Um, but it, what it means is that we, we haven't finished yet, right? These are 12, but you'll have 13 and 14 and 35, right? And that's, that's really why, in some ways, why I was prompted to pull this book together was I thought, well, we're all creating lessons, right? Lessons that are usually ignored, lessons that are thought to be, aha, naive, the famous patriarchal put down, right? Which is highly, right? Watch, watch the word naive anywhere. And this book though is hopefully, um, grounded in gritty real, real realities. And the main reality that I think, if there's any kind of bold statement, you know, kind of the bumper sticker, okay, here's my bumpers. Don't you always want to see if you could reduce your own thesis to a bumper sticker? Like, do you really know what you're arguing? Dan, I bet you could do it. I bet you could. I bet you could reduce one of your newest book to a bumper sticker, right? I, and that is, Women's wars are not men's wars. Women, this is, I think this is what I learned from trying to pull these ideas together. Women's wars are not men's wars. And what does that mean? What is what did that what when I looked back at it, what did that mean? It meant I couldn't I couldn't think of simply victims. I couldn't think of simply perpetrators. I couldn't think of simply war criminals. I couldn't think, watch now, I couldn't think of simply children. I couldn't think of simply parents. I couldn't think of simply national security experts which I always put in quotes, but I, I couldn't think of national security experts. I couldn't think of weapons engineers. I do think a lot about people who design weapons. I couldn't think of any of those ungendered categories. 
in a way that was useful. That I, I was saying back to myself, women's wars are not men's wars, which means one has to turn on all the bright gender analytical lights to make sense of children, to make sense of parents, to make sense of weapons engineers, to make sense of every category we use to describe wars. Women's wars are not men's wars. Why? First of all, because of the practices and laws of marriage. Now, I don't know about you, how many of you, this is the good news and the bad news, okay. How many of you think of yourself as studying international politics and or political science? Come be honest, you know, don't worry, don't look hold, okay. How many of you in the study of political science, see all the rest of you are smarter because you haven't been channeled into these narrow questions. But when I was at Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley, when it was supposedly the radical 60s, <laughs> nobody said that if you want to study politics, you have to understand marriage. Nobody said that. Well, also, they never said we should even study the police. They gave the police over to the sociologists and marriage over to the anthropologists. And I don't know what we, well, we were stuck with what was left, we in political science. But one of the things that I've come to understand, partly through everyone else tutoring me, is that you cannot make sense, you, I, we, we cannot make sense of the realities the messy, gritty, ongoing, over time, realities of war unless we open up the box of marriage. <clears throat> what are the grounds for divorce in the country you're interested in? What are the laws about inheritance in the country you're interested in? What are the laws about child custody in the country you're interested in? What are the laws about driving, about taking out a loan, about owning property, about land titles? That's all marriage. And it affects how every woman and every man copes with the horrors of war. So to say that women's wars are not men's wars is not to create a hierarchy of who suffers more than whom. That's not a feminist project. The creation of hierarchies is not what we're up to. But it does say to be explanatorily realistic, you better break open the box. You better look at, in fact, how women's wars are not men's wars in the place you're interested in. Now, the second thing about Marshall's fabulous question is, how did this come about? Well, it came about partly through my friend Candida Lacey, who's on Zoom in Italy. <laughs> now, is that, un that's unfair, Candida. <laughs> Candida is a wonderful, wonderful editor. Um, and she and I were the team that created the very first edition of Bananas, Beaches, and Bases. And then we've come around, I wouldn't say full circle because we're not done yet, but we've come around. Um, and Candida said to me when she was working with the wonderful Footnote Press, where Grace Harrison is here um, uh, uh, sponsoring the, um, the event, um, that she said, well, I'm working with this wonderful, new, edgy, interesting, creative press, Footnote Press. Um, and don't you have something that you would like to turn into a book? I said, well, no, actually, you know. She said, well, because she and I have known each other for a long time. Um, she said, well, don't you, haven't you started some files about anything? And that's how I start writing books without knowing I'm writing a book. I, I start, I'm just interested in something. 
And I began to, to be try to be very interested in, not as an expert, um, in the war in Ukraine, the Russian imperialist invasion of Ukraine. I don't speak Ukrainian. Um, I am not an Eastern European specialist by any means. I'm very much an amateur, but I thought I have to try and do what I can to understand this war. And I began starting files, not with the thought that I would become a talking head about something that I really was an amateur in, but something just for my own personal effort to try and understand. And as I did that, I began to realize, and this is where Canada hooked me, I realized that I've been taught by so many people in so many countries about what to ask. I haven't been taught just, oh, here's how it works. I've been taught, here's what to be curious about. And those feminist activists and thinkers are the ones that really have informed this book. And once Candid and I started to really talk about that, then we came up with this format uh, for what is hopefully an undaunting, um, uh, widely um, usable uh, book. So let me just start by giving some thanks, by giving, by reading just one part. I'm not a on the audio book of him. <laughs> okay. I don't know what you, if you listen to audio books, yeah, okay. Okay, think of 16 hours in a booth about the big as size of this table in North London, right? With a really, really, really good, thank God, um, sound engineer who starts you and stops you and starts you and stops you to finally be able to read one page without blipping over somebody. Um, and, um, so I tried to practice. I'm not really good at it, but I'm going to read this one paragraph because it gives a sense that I hope will show you how widely and deeply over the years people have taught me about how to ask questions to make more realistic, that's a small r, sense of wars. Jimena took me on a driving tour of Santiago to show me where Pinochet's military had set up torture chambers in ordinary apartment houses, in suburban homes. Sister Soledad described the system around US Navy bases that prostituted Filipinas. Insoc opened my eyes to militarism inside a pro-democracy movement. Rayla introduced me to the Haifa Women in Black. Ruri showed me the brightly neon lit shopping area where the Tokyo Women in Black stood vigil every Friday night. Aisha introduced me to the Kurdish women in southeastern Turkey who had opened a restaurant as a way to tackle domestic violence in a war zone. Madeline tutored me in the UN's Byzantine patriarchal ways. Nella took me on a walk up the steep hill overlooking Sarajevo, so I could imagine the perches from which the snipers picked off civilians as they dashed out to run desperate errands during the Yugoslav War. Those are just some of my tutors. And they, they tutored me by not just occasionally it would be over a strong coffee and tell me, you know, you have to pay attention to this or you've missed that. I mean, that's, those are the best. But they also, as you could see, they physically took me places to say, if you don't really kind of get a grip on the 
physicality of this armed conflict. You really won't be able to be a good explainer. Um, if there are three things, and we want to get to Amanda here, if there are three things that I think run through all 12 of these so-called lessons. These are lessons in understanding, by the way. They're not lessons in how to fight a war, right? Um, there are plenty of people out there in the world who turn that into military academy curricula, right? Um, or national security textbooks. That's not what these lessons are about. These lessons are, so how in these times, and as Marsha said, the times don't get easier. How in these times, whether you're in Myanmar or you're in Sudan or you're in Gaza or you're in Israel or you're in Ukraine, in these times, how do you grapple with understanding? And understanding matters. If we don't have understanding, or if we are satisfied, because lots of people want us to be lazy, you know. A lot of people don't want us to be too curious. A lot of people don't really want us to follow up our curiosity. If we eschew that kind of intellectual comfort zone, we're much more likely to prevent wars, to shorten wars, and to end wars in a way that creates a sustainable peace. Put it the other way. With only superficial understanding or incomplete understanding or really actually distorted understanding, we won't be able to prevent the next war wherever it happens. We won't be able to shorten wars as devastating as they are. And the kind of peace we will create is going to be part of Marsh's book, why we're all going to read it. The kind of peace we create will be so fragile that it will set in place the dynamics for the next war. It will be called peace, but it will be looked back upon as pre-war to the next war. The three themes I think that run through this, Marsha asked me to look at this, is that feminists, feminist activists, feminist researchers have been teaching us for at least 120 years, not just since the 1990s. We have a lot of lessons that we never learned. We never paid enough attention to the activism of women from combatant, mutually rival governments let's call governments what they are rather than just countries, who met in The Hague in 1915 to try to end that horrific war. But how many of us study, except we have our Swedish Wilp person here who could educate us on this, how many of us in any so-called political science class or international relations class have ever spent I don't know, a week, maybe a class session on the Women's Peace Congress in 1915 to look at their analysis, to look at their demands and where their demands came from, how they got there. How did women from combatant countries get to the Hague in 1915? Who were they? 
How much did it have to do with their suffrage activism? How much did it have to do with their Quakerism for some? How much did it have to do with having done welfare work in the poorest neighborhoods of their own home cities? How much? So the first thing is we have been taught by a lot of people who we ignored. And that's embarrassing, but it's worth taking on board and then asking who persuaded us to ignore them? Who dismissed them as old fashioned? Because look at the hats. I mean, really, could you take seriously? Jane Adams in that hat. Oh yeah, actually, you could. Everything we wear tonight will look funny, by the way, in about 20 years, right? Um, so how come we don't understand that we need to imbibe those lessons that some feminists tried to teach us 120 years ago? B, curious i found about one's own dismissiveness the second thing that runs through these 12 and counting lessons is that being curious about women's wars and men's wars means and all of you know this to be interested in all kinds of women in all kinds of settings and not just women who look heroic, though a lot of women are heroic and they are interesting. But to be a feminist in your curiosity about where women are and where men are in wars means to be interested in all kinds of women, including those that you don't feel very sympathetic to, including those who don't have the chance to learn how to read and write and therefore have never written down their ideas. All kinds of women in all kinds of settings. And it gives the sense of what we now call intersectionality a much wider, deeper understanding. One of the things that I've learned over the years from so many of my tutors is that I really have underestimated the urban rural divide amongst women in so many of our societies. But we usually don't add urban, rural inequalities and differences when we think of intersectionality. The third thing that runs through this short assortment here is that militarization which is the process by which, you all know this, it's the process by which anything, any institution, LSE, Kings, Westminster, my own university, by which anything, fashion, have a real conversation the next time you see somebody that you know dressed in camo about what they think they're doing. <laughs> now, I mean, real, now, but you got to have a real conversation now. I mean, if it's like, what in the hell do you think you're doing? It's not going to end up being much of a conversation, right? But if it's really about what, what, do, what kind, what is this appealing? What does this, why does this feel kind of hip and with it? You know, again, you see already, look at my tone. I just slip right into something that will just kill a dead conversation. Right? But you can militarize anything. You can militarize a battered women's shelter if it serves the local military base. So the local military base commander doesn't have to worry about domestic violence on the base. You can militarize anything. That is, you can make it work to confirm the value of militarized thinking. But 
militarization because it's a process and because it's so dependent on ideas about masculinities and ideas about femininities, always plural, plural. Because it's so dependent on ideas about men protecting women, about masculinity going along with expertise, about first class citizen armed soldiers. Because it's so dependent on those deeply gendered ideas, if you expose it, you weaken it. The second thing, and this I think here more than ever, I've really tried to think about it. I don't, I'm still in the middle of my thinking. And that is that militarization, one step down the line, doesn't mean you've given in to everything. That you, it's, it's not the same as being pregnant. You can be a little militarized. Right? That is, that is somebody can convince you that the world is a dangerous place. And that, for a lot of us, makes total sense to think that the world, the opposite would be, the world is a cooperative place. But if you think it makes utter sense to see the world as a dangerous place, doesn't mean you automatically think that somebody who becomes a soldier is more worthy of the adjective courageous than somebody who leaves a violent partner. You can be a little militarized and not become more militarized. You can become a little militarized where the camel tank top, and not automatically think that weaponry brings security. And this takes away some of the power of the process of militarization. It means it can be challenged, it can be stopped in its tracks. It is not if you believe that there is something genuine about a self defense use of military force, it doesn't mean that you accept all the patriarchal trappings of militarization. So that that really, I think I, I think thanks to Canada, um, I, I think writing this book has really, again, I'm not at the end of this thought, but has made me really come to grips more with that militarization isn't all or nothing. It isn't that if you moved maybe unthinkingly or maybe thinkingly, several steps down the militarization path, it doesn't mean that you're gone. It doesn't mean that it is such a greased path that you can't stop yourself from going the next step, the next step, the next step. You can, we can. Thanks. Okay, I don't know if I follow that up. Um, I'm going to be brief with my comments because I want to again give the floor to Cynthia. Um, my comments are more of my reflections on reading your book. Um, and I love reading your book because I always feel like I'm having a conversation with you when I'm when I'm reading it too. So offer some brief comments, um, hopefully um, seduce all of you into buying multiple copies of uh, Cynthia's book. And then I she doesn't get a commission. You know. <laughs> doing this out of love. Um, and then I, I have a few hopefully not so intense um, <laughs> questions to Marsha's, but um, just to um so hopefully that you can reflect upon and then and then open it up to the audience Does, yeah okay so I'll get going um I wrote down the thoughts otherwise I meander down different um 
rabbit holes and it's not so organized. So I'll organize my thoughts here. Um, so Cynthia, I just want to begin by saying, I love your book. And I mean, I love your work in general, and I love this book, and I feel so honored to be sharing the stage here with you and with Marsha and um, and to celebrate your feminist ethical commitment to generating and disseminating important feminist knowledge and lessons globally. And you certainly pay homage to um, all of uh, the women um, in the book. You um, definitely you can see them com coming through and the lessons that you've learned from them. So thank you for that. It's an important ethical commitment for feminists and, and thank you for doing that work. Um, your book centers the knowledge produced by feminists amid war and the aftermaths of war and before as you talk about guns are even fired, right? Your lesson one is worth repeating, I think. Women's wars are not men's wars. Uh, details that women's wars start before again any fart, fought, uh, shots are fired. And as we become um, more uh, feminist in our curiosity, we learn that to make realistic sense of women's experiences of war, we need to be curious about the conditions of women and girls' lives before war even right. begins. And so, you know, importantly, as you, um, you know, you've um, as stated, um, I just want to quote right from your book, because I think it's, it's great. To absorb the reality that women do not experience war in the same ways that men do is not to set up women and men in rivalry hierarchies and suffering. I think that's important because that's a misnomer about a lot of feminist work, right? Um, uh, because decisions made by people, usually, though not solely, by men, that are based on their combined gender stereotypes, gender aspirations, and gender values, women and girls, and boys and men are positioned differently in wartime. And as a result, what they suffer is not the same. How those gendered sufferings shape post-war stories, myths, celebrations, and revenge narratives are not the same. So this is what your book really gets us to explore. That's that's the first lesson. It's the first lesson. I'm not going to go through all of that. <laughs> Um, in subsequent lessons, your book demonstrates the concrete successes, hard fought, even though they still remain fragile, um, and the enduring care and solidarity that is done across what militarism and patriarchy believe us to be impossible, right? So you give us hope in, in thinking that. And lesson eight, for example, feminist organizing while war is ra uh, raging, uh, you, I think, in an amazing way, trace feminist activism well before World War II or World War I, through World War I, through the development of and passing of Resolution 1325 uh, to contemporary conflicts, right? So you have a huge historical trajectory of, of feminist activism and feminist campaigning. And you show that feminist transnational knowledge gained around mobilizing and campaigning and the uneasy negotiation with patriarchal and militarized organizations. And I think Resolution 1325 highlights that quite well. You illuminate women, globali uh, women mobilizing in Japan, Nepal, Colombia, Ukraine, the Middle East, and throughout Africa, reclaiming lost histories, lost wounds, lost traumas in these different spaces. So not only is your work uh, it, you know, a historical kind of reflection, but it's also global in its reach too. Um, throughout your book, you show women working across state lines, across class distinctions, across urban rural geographies, spanning again, pre-World War I up until now. And you show the diverse work feminists do, the tenuous connections um, that are made through every day often thankless work that is foundational for alliances and solidarity building in war and the afterlives once the guns lay down themselves. Um, and that these buildings of communities are life-saving too, you highlight that. Feminism amid militarism is exhausting as much as it's vital. Um, and I'm reminded again of a poignant quote that you highlight in lesson 10, what we can learn from Ukrainian feminists. And you quote a Ukrainian feminist saying, simply being Ukrainian women doing feminist grassroots work was not itself enough to create a level of trust required for action committed solidarity. Building feminist solidarity when militarism is escalating can take time, long walks, lots of coffee. So you highlight, I think, um, quite well how these solidarities are formed, right? Um, overall, this book, 
through this book as the ones that have preceded it. Uh, you inspire me and I hope, yeah, I think that the colleagues here to always dig deeper and to hone in our, on our own feminist curiosities, as you call it, and not rely upon this dull cynicism that makes us um, almost without thinking claim, oh, that's just patriarchy, oh, that's just militarism, right? Um, because your book shows us very clearly how both militarism and patriarchy um, can dollar analytical senses, and they're designed to do that, right? That because that makes us easy, it makes it easier for us to invest in the very binaries and boundaries of patriarchy and militarism that keep us from being curious about the inner workings of gender and power in these spaces. And your work through paying attention to the everyday lives of feminist practice, the feminist collaboration and or uneasy alliances made in war and in response to militarism, we see how militarism, how patriarchy, how white supremacy is all refashioned, sometimes in unpredictable ways, and how the personal, again, is very much the international. And with all of this, you still leave space for hope. Right, and that's what I love about your writing too. That militarism and patriarchy is not our story. It's not the end story. And we can and must work collectively for a more just, safer and demilitarized world. So that's what your book does. And that's what I love about your writing. And now that I hopefully convinced everyone in this room to buy Cynthia's book, I have two questions for you. Um, you know, uh, uh, as Marsha alluded to um, very abstractly in the introduction of, of this talk, we do find ourselves currently in a space where we're told is a fog of war, right? Um, and I actually love in your book how you draw upon this metaphor because fog is doing a lot of politics here, right? And I wonder if you can reflect here for us, the audience tonight, the political work you see the fog of war doing and how you see feminists perhaps responding to this. And I, this is a tough question, I'm, I'm, I, I'll admit that. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you see or think that there might be another metaphor other than fog of war that might be more helpful for feminists when we're talking about um, a, a, a war and war making? And then the final question, I think, is more, uh, it's, it's in line with this one, too, is that you talk about, again, in your book, the need to home in and develop feminist concepts that work for us and that continue to be fit for purpose and not just develop a concept, leave it, but constantly review it to see if it's fit for, pur for purpose in how we understand war and how we can better respond to powerful workings of militarism and patriarchy. And I'm asking you from your previous concepts that you've developed um, and, and given to us as a feminist community is how do you think, where are the women? And the personal is international for you. How do you think that connects to the building of better feminist knowledge on war and military? And you said you weren't going to be asking. I know. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean to. Yeah. Anyway, so I'll leave it there. And yeah. And, and the first question was more about. The first question was actually the fog of war. Oh, yes, what you yes. think the politics of the fog of war is doing and how you think feminists yeah. need to be responding to that. And the second one is around concepts of how yes. we understand war. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I think, do you mind if I walk around? No, is it okay? Okay. Um, you know, um, I began looking at fog of war in the middle of thinking about it what was going into this book, because I hate that phrase. I really, it is wielded so that we will not be curious. It is wielded so that we imagine that it's impossible to hold anybody accountable. Fog of War, Amanda knows this, for me, Fog of War, is the perfect camouflage to provide impunity. I remember the first friend of mine who used the word impunity. It was another one of my tutors named Rita Arditi. And Rita wrote one of the best um, ethnographic books about the madres of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina. 
And Rita, who's a neighbor and a longtime friend, Rita, I don't, Rita wouldn't shake her finger at me, would she? Oh, she might have. I felt as though she was. I mean, as a good friend does, like Cynthia. And, and she said, impunity. Try to watch how impunity is created. Impunity doesn't just exist, Rita said. Impunity is manufactured to protect somebody from some kind of accountability. And when I began thinking about how fog of war is used, I began thinking about Rita. I began thinking about impunity. Because of course the Madres of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, who then became the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo, never underestimate older women. <laughs> The grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo refused to think that the end of the Argentinian junta, military government, meant that all the men, because they were men, who acted to violate people's rights during the junta should be forget not forgiven, ignored. And that's why Rita, working on the mothers and the grandmothers of the Plaza de Maya was so adamant about impunity and not allowing it to be manufactured, not allowing it to seep into our brains so it felt, so it feels like impunity is peace. Oh, don't dig up that old Does this ring true in the UK in uh, October of 2023, folks. Is the majority party in Commons? But they're not alone. And the Argentinian feminists could teach us not to allow impunity to feel comfortable as if it's peace. But it also means, and this is why Amanda's reading is so important, it also means that in the midst of the confusion of the waging of war, displacement, damage, uncertainty, violence, fear, in the midst of that, you can still be curious. You can still try to document. You can support those people who are trying to investigate. I came to think that later is a patriarchal time zone. That is when people say, it's too confusing now. There's too much horror now. We'll investigate that later. Later is a patriarchal time zone. Later will never come. Because by the time later comes, patriarchy in its new costumes will be more entrenched than ever. And I think fog of war, it doesn't mean you have to think everything is clear. It's not. You don't have to think there isn't confusion. There is. You don't have to think that people are more certain than in fact they could possibly be in the midst of such collective violence. You don't have to think that to think, I support journalists with ethical practice and ethical editors. Always watch journalists and their editors. It doesn't mean that investigators for the prosecution office in The Hague can't be deployed. They can be deployed. They should be deployed. It doesn't mean that humanitarian 
staff people, highly skilled in tracking damage and hurt and deprivation. It doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to keep accurate records. They should. That is the fog of war is not something that we should accept. I think. The second question. Oh my God, Amanda. Sorry. What have you done? To I asked you the tough question. No, oh, you both of those. Oh, where are the women? Okay. Yeah. Um, here's what I like about where are the women. The reason I posed it back in the first edition of Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, which how Canada and I worked on together. Um, uh, the reason I liked asking the question is because I've never asked it. I went all the way through my PhD work in allegedly radical Berkeley of the 1960s, and I never noticed I was only studying men. And why would you notice? I never noticed. In fact, I didn't even, this is, okay, this is confession time. I never even noticed that all 50, that's five zero, all 50 tenure track faculty members in the Department of Political Science at University of California at Berkeley, all 50 were men. And I had gone to a women's <laughs> university and I didn't notice. <laughs> So when I came to noticing, I wanted everybody to notice. You know, nobody has to be as dumb as I was for as long as I was, really. And I think though what happens and has continued to happen to me, I, I look at every photograph. Don't you look at every collective photograph and count? Well, I always count. If it's in a beauty parlor, I count the photograph. If it's a bank tellers, I count. If it is of national security experts, I count. If it's of national security councils of a particular state, I count. If it's the heads of NATO defense ministries meeting in Brussels, I count. I always count because when I started to wonder where are the women, I started to notice men. That's, what, that's really one of the great advantages of feminist curiosity, that generals are never just generals, that professors of IR are never just professors of IR, that Editors in chief of major newspapers in a country are not just editors in chief. It doesn't mean that their masculinity explains everything about them. But if you're not curious, if I'm not curious about their masculinity and how it might play into what they do, then I will have an incomplete understanding, an incomplete explanation of what they are doing and why they're doing it. In the rain, I caught a taxi. I mean, I know that's a miracle. Anyway, I, I caught a black cab. I caught a woman taxi driver. This is just this afternoon. We had, it was like a tutorial. We, because the traffic was so slow, so we got to talk a lot, right? coming down Kingsway. Two, she said, there used to be 2% of all black cab drivers who were women. But she said, it's declining. Really? I mean, really, if we had just gotten stalled forever, I would have been, you know, I would have missed you. But I, I would have been, you know, I would have been very happy. I was really, she and I were on a roll here, right? You know. Um, as we stood absolutely still. And she said, oh, I have to share this with you because who else am I going to tell? Said, but here's what she said. She said, oh, the powers that be 
that set the standards and the rules for the black cabs of London have just set a new rule about how old your taxi can be. And they have set, and I'm now going to forget, but you can look it up. They've set a, the car, the black cab now has to be X, only X numbers of years old, not older. And she said, but most of us, 2%, 2% is evidently 2,000 of the black cab driver. She said, but most of us lady taxi drivers can't afford a newer car. We overwhelmingly buy older cabs. So by this supposedly gender blind rule, which means nobody asked any gender questions when they debated the rule, by this new gender blind rule, women taxi drivers are quitting because they can't afford a new car. Uh -huh. This is why you don't have to always go for a doctorate in order to understand the sociology of patriarchy. Okay? But it does make me think, Amanda, that by asking where are the women, in this case in the black cab industry of London, it makes you wonder where are the guys? What kind of guys? What are their relationship with the diverse women who are the women? Because the women are never. Monolithic, of course, of course. And so I think asking where are the women makes one more conscious of the workings of the ideologies of masculinities and the ideologies of femininities. And that's a great benefit from feminist analysis for everybody. You don't have to, I mean, it would be nice, you don't have to be a feminist. I mean, it helps, but you don't have to be a feminist, but having feminist curiosity will make you smarter. That's a promise, right? With the, can I even quote myself correctly? The, the international is personal, or do I say the personal is international? The personal is international. The personal is international, and the international is personal. Yeah. I guess there are two bunch <laughs> Mistake. I think what that came for me was when I began looking at garment workers and I began to understand because I studied the international political economy of trade and I began to realize a garment, a woman who's a garment worker, there are men in garment factories. They tend to run the zipper machines, by the way, in the Levi's factories. Um, which pay more. Um, but about 70% of all garment workers in the world are women. And I began to realize that how they manage their lives as factory workers was so dependent on their relationship with their mothers and their fathers, some of whom they supported in the rural areas by sending money home. Their relationships with their partners particularly male partners, their relationships with their children, that those were all part and parcel of the international political economy of the garment trade. And that is what led me to think that the international is personal. Put it the other way. If we think the international all happens up here as most national security experts imagine and want us to imagine, then you never think about domestic violence. You never think about child care. You never think about violence against women on long commutes to a factory. And if we don't ask about those questions, when we think about the international trade in anything, then we are unrealistic about what goes into making the international 
political economy we live in and live off of or are oppressed by. That's Okay, just before I close, thank you very much for your patience and sorry to all the people that didn't get uh, to ask questions. I want to, first of all, thank uh, Cynthia for agreeing and coming to this uh, um, exploration of your book, celebration of your book. Um, I want to thank Amanda Chisholm from Kings and Kings for participating in this um, event. And I guess I wanted to um, end by sort of tying up uh, the final uh, lesson, which I think reflects a lot of what people have shared today. Um, and that's really around needing two particular things to continue to think about war in the current context, um, uh, as well as in our academic life. And that's really about the stamina that's needed. And I think I think stamina and stomach, because I don't know for many of you who have been following the news and following all the social media and also personal mm. uh, messages, um, we do need stamina. But I think we also need to continue that solidarity along these complex um, um, these complex relations of solidarity. You know, we need to um, think about those questions about the human, those questions about, you know, what are our obligations, those feminist networks, those feminist corridors, really, um, who, um, yeah, I think we, we, I think that comes out very much in that, on those last two pages of your 12th, of the 12th lesson and counting. And so, um, yeah, I really want to uh, thank you for raising all those issues and and for starting the conversation, but I think we, we need to continue it um, that much more. Okay, thank you. Thank you.